Kuya Mora, good morning. I'm not angry at anyone. <laughs> uh, I love you all. Um, it's a pleasure and a joy to be here this morning. Um, so my name is Dani um, Griff. My wife Anishka is here in the maroon in the front. Um, I'm not a full-time pastor. I work in a fishing, at the fishing company in finance. Um, I've been following God since 2015. Um, I love him um, with everything on my heart. I am standing here this morning definitely not because I'm perfect. Okay, I'm standing here definitely not because everything I'm going to tell you this morning, I get right. Okay, I'm, telling, I'm standing here this morning telling you that everything I just prayed, I am most probably guilty of. Okay, I'm standing here not because I deserve it. I'm standing here because of God's grace on my life that has enabled me to stand here. Um, it's just because of His grace. It's because of what He's done. And this is me trying to be obedient um, in what He has called me to do. Uh, me standing here is not more spiritual than you sitting there. Okay? That sounds nice, but I want you to click that thing. Like me standing here is not spir more spiritual than you sitting there. Okay, we are called, and we're going to speak about that this morning, is to let God's kingdom come through our lives. And that looks different for all of us. Okay, if I am supposed to stand here and I'm sitting there, then there's something wrong. Okay, but if I'm supposed to be sitting there and I'm standing here, then there's also something wrong. So you just need to know that you are doing what God has asked you to do. Okay? So we're speaking about the kingdom of God and what that looks like. Last week, Johanna shared about every kingdom having a king. And last week's sermon is really, really key to really flow into this week. Um, if God and Jesus Christ is not the king of your life, it's really, really difficult, and I almost want to say impossible, to really allow his kingdom to come through your life because it's going to be dead works. Okay, you're going to try to do a lot of things and because you think you're trying to please God, um, and it's going to be really tough. I always say I have a trigger point when Christians say, yo, but it's tough to be a Christian. <laughs> okay, if I, anyone says that in my conversation, I usually get triggered. I'm like, okay, Lord, do I need to say something? Do I be quiet? Uh, so I've got the mic this morning, so now I can say something. Um, so being a Christian is tough when Jesus is not your king. Okay, when you are trying to please two kings and two masters, then it is really tough. And I can understand where you're coming from. Okay, it's really difficult trying to please a lot of people. But if you're trying to please one, okay, one, the one that created you, the one that breathed life into you, the one that has always been there and that will always be there, man, it's joyful. <laughs> I can tell you it's amazing. There's nothing better in life than being a Christian. There is no greater joy. There is no better thing in life than being in this life with Christ. Yes, it's going to be difficult. Yes, you're going to have trials. Yes, you're going to have tribulations. But you're going to have it with Him. Okay? He's going to be there with you. People that don't know God also go through difficult stuff. Okay? But they go through it without Him. They don't know there's a God that can help them. They don't know there's a God that can help them through it. We do. Like being a Christian is amazing. We've got everything we need Christ fulfilling us in every situation. And there's nothing better in life than knowing I have one king to please. There's one kingdom I'm serving, and there's one person that I need to please forever in life. And that's amazing. So you really, this morning, everything I'm going to say is assuming that you've made Christ the king in your life. Okay, assuming that you're not serving two masters, Assuming that you're not trying to please a lot of people, but you're trying to please one, and that is God. And if that's not the case, um, well, I really want to encourage you to do it. Because, not because it's, you might have to with me, not because it's going to be difficult. Like, a, what's straf in English? My English is also gone. Punishment. punishment. Not because it's a punishment, because it's a joy. Okay, it's a joy to follow Christ. It's not a punishment. It's not a punishment to make him your king. It's a joy. So we're going to talk about seeking first the kingdom of God. A phrase we sing often, a phrase we often hear, 
What does that really mean? Let's read in Matthew 6. Let's read verse 10. Verse 10 is part of the prayer Jesus teaches us how to pray. An amazing intercession. We always say if you, if you go to intercession, you're basically seeing a glimpse of what's going to happen in the sermon and what's going to happen through the week. So I'm just going to share this so that you guys see it's not just a story. Like the Holy Spirit is live. No one knew this is... Well, Natasha definitely didn't know the scripture is in my sermon. This morning at intercession, she's like, that's just... She just felt like the Lord's Prayer is coming up the whole time and she just wants to pray it over us before we started the intercession. And this verse was literally prayed over us at intercession and here it is in the sermon this morning. Like God is alive, okay? If you do not believe in God and if you are still skeptical, I want to tell you, just ask God to show himself to you because he does exist, okay? If there's anything in you that doubts whether there is a God and you are this morning here and you're still trying to see things out, I want to tell you with everything in my heart, it's really simple. Okay, you just close your eyes and you say, God, please show yourself to me. And he is going to. Okay, maybe in a moment, maybe in a week's time, maybe in a month. I don't know when, that's on to him. But if you seek him and you ask him to show himself to you, he's going to do it. Because he's faithful and he loves you so much. So Matthew 6 verse 10. Jesus says, we need to pray in this way. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your being in the capital letter meaning God. So God's kingdom, God's will on earth as it is in heaven. Sounds very nice. You've probably all heard this before if you've been in Christian circles. But what does this look like? What does it look like? Let's take the first line. God's kingdom to come. What does that mean? What would it look like in Walfish Bay if God's kingdom comes? Like, what does that trigger in your mind? If you like, yo, God's kingdom came in Walfish Bay this week. What would that mean? Like, what would practically have happened? So, that would look like the life of Jesus. Okay, what would Walfish Bay look like if Jesus was roaming in the streets? What would would Walfish Bay look like if Jesus was at your workplace? Um, What would it look like? Jesus was bringing God's kingdom to earth through his life every day. So the lost were being saved. The broken were being healed. Okay, his kingdom was coming. He was reconciling the lost back to the Father. So that is what it looks like for God's kingdom to come. And it says, your will be done. And this is again speaking back to last week. God needs to be your king. Okay? His will be done, not ours, not my will, not my family's will, not my wife's will, God's will, no one else but the Lord, living to please one, and that is Him. On earth, as it is in heaven. I'm not going to go into this too much. There's a lot I can say on this um, line, but that is basically saying that what we're going to have in heaven one day, being in God's presence, it's something that we can experience on earth already. We're not just living, having a ticket to go to heaven, but that we can, through the power of the Holy Spirit, bring heaven down to earth. So what that is, is being in God's presence, for example. When you're worshiping and you experience God's presence, that is a glimpse of heaven. That is what it's going to be like one day in heaven, being in His presence, worshiping Him forever. Okay, so we're bringing heaven to earth, if I can put it in that way. As I said, there's a lot to say on that line. And then we read through the rest of Matthew 6. And it speaks about how we should not worry, about how we should not gather for ourselves treasure on earth, but gather for ourselves treasure in heaven. We're going to skip to Matthew 6, 31 to 34. It says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. seek. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, or that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow worries about its own things. Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. So now, from this point onwards, it's no longer Donnie telling you to seek the kingdom first. Now you can see Jesus said it. Okay? So now it's not my words. Now it's the word of Jesus. So Jesus told us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that mean? So the question is, in your life, what would your life look like and what is it currently looking like for the kingdom? Whose kingdom are you building? Johannes shared last week about the white picket fence kingdom, and which is a term used to say we're building our own kingdoms for our own comfort and our joys and our own pleasures, and we're just trying to make our life as comfortable and enjoyable as possible um, instead of laying down our lives for the cost of Christ. So we see you know, the, mo- the, moment, the moment you give your life to Christ, he says, pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. From that moment onwards, it was no longer your kingdom. Okay? It might have been your kingdom up to that point, but on that moment, you decided to say, Lord, I choose to follow you. That moment, everything you thought you own, and it's on your name, no longer belongs to you. <laughs> okay, it belongs to his kingdom. So if you, can have, if you have an imagination, and we can take ourselves back to the times when there were kingdoms, so if he's the king, and he's calling you in, and he says, hey, um, I need that car. He doesn't tell you why. He doesn't tell you for what reason. And if you're going to be like, no, but I need to get to work. <laughs> no, but I, I worked really hard for that car. <laughs> Man, I studied. I worked late nights. I did a lot. I have a family to care for. How am I going to survive without that car? I don't think if there's this king and we're looking to him, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the, the courage to question him. I wouldn't. And it would be really arrogant of me. Um, it would be really arrogant of me to question a king reigning in his kingdom. Okay, and if that's an earthly king, he can make mistakes. But we've got a perfect king. Okay, we've got a perfect king, a perfect father that loves you, and that knows everything. Yet, we are sometimes, but, yeah, Lord, don't I deserve this? Don't I, didn't I work really hard to get to this place, and now you're taking it away from me? He's the king. <laughs> we are not. He knows better. Which of you, through worrying, can add one day to your life? None. So let's get, get a bit practical. So I just feel like I need to say this. For those of you who don't know me, okay, I'm a really straight shooter. <laughs> okay, I'm not angry at anyone. I love all of you. I am speaking to myself, as I said, now, now but I call a spade a spade, um, and that's, that's me. So welcome to, welcome to show for this morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's start at our homes. What would our homes look like if the kingdom of God was coming and we are making his kingdom come in our homes and our families? And I'm putting this first because it is really important. Um, Our homes and our families um, should be quite high in our priority list. And there's something I'm currently journeying on myself as well. Um, and, And specifically for the men, we need to lead our homes well. Okay, you... We as men, we cannot lead a business, lead a church, lead a ministry, if we cannot first lead our homes. Okay, it it says if you want to be an elder, your house needs to be in order. Meaning your house, you need to be able to rule your house well before you are able to rule anything else well. Like your house needs to be first. Um, Ruling your house and making sure your house is in order should be our first priority. 
before we lead in any other place, in any other capacity. So it really doesn't matter what job you have, how hard you think your job is, and how much you think your family needs your provision. Um, your first job is to make sure you're present and you're leading your house well, and yes, provision will come from that. Um, it is, you need to provide for your family, but I just really want to emphasize that, is that in, in trying to provide, don't start making your job and something else more important than the reason why you're actually trying to provide. Remember why you're providing. You're, you're providing for your family, not to try and, and climb a corporate ladder um, or whatever it may be. So just remember the reason why you applied for that job and why you're working there in the first place. And don't allow that thing to later actually start having a negative consequence on the reason why you did it in the first place. So we need to lead our house well first. And that is spiritual, <laughs> okay? It's pleasing unto God when we lead our house as well. It's pleasing unto God when wives submit unto their husbands. Okay, that is just as spiritual as me standing here. It's just as spiritual as you praying in tongues in your quiet room. Okay, it's really spiritual when we make His kingdom come through these practical ways in our lives. Everything does not have to be this charismatic thing. So... For God's kingdom to come in our homes, our, God, our homes need to be in godly order. Okay, godly order we see in the Bible. It says God, husband, wife. Okay, that's godly order. I don't have kids yet, but I've heard this through other people who have kids. <laughs> and what they told me was that the best gift and the best example married couples can give to their children is their example and their love towards each other. Okay, your love towards your husband and the wife's love towards both ways is the greatest gift you can give to your kids. Okay, you can teach your kids about love and you can teach them about kindness. If the two of you are not kind and loving towards each other, your teaching is almost in vain. Okay, so really, husbands and wives, be careful um, and be attent on how you love each other in front of your kids because it really creates a safe environment where kids can flourish when they see there's an healthy marriage in homes. And that is godly. And that is allowing God's kingdom to come. God's kingdom to come in your home is you loving your wife and the wife loving the husband. And that is God raising godly offspring through that. Finance. How can we allow God's kingdom to come through our finances? Show me your bank statement, and I'll show you where your heart is. So let's make a summary, and let's see where all that money is going. And I'll tell you what you really enjoy in life. Okay? And that is biblical, that's scripture. Show me your treasure, and I'll show you where your heart is. If you don't know where your heart is, just go look at your bank. You'll see exactly where your heart is. You'll see exactly what you enjoy spending on. Because that is where you easily give. Where you easily give, your heart is. Where you don't want to give, your heart is not. It's so simple. God loves a cheerful giver. Are we allowing the money that does not belong to us are we allowing God's kingdom to come through the money that does not belong to us? Okay? I'm not saying you need to go and sell everything, but if God is telling you to sell everything, then I am saying it. Okay? You need to do what God is telling you to do without limitations, without holding back. That example of the car. If God is telling you to give away your car and you need to be without a car for the next year, so be it. Okay, there are people who are without cars for their entire life. We are so comfortable. And we are not called for comfort, we are called for obedience. Okay, God is a magnificent, amazing provider. I can tell you guys, and it's, we, don't, yeah, we, we refrain from boasting on finances in front here because it sounds boastful. All I can say, and I'm not going into the details, when God asks you to be obedient, He's faithful. That's all you need to know. He is faithful. And I've seen it in my life. I've seen it through other people's lives. Just be obedient and allow God 
to use your finances. Because if you are sitting here and you've got anxiety over finances, and by the seventh of the month, you start counting down until payday, you've got a problem. <laughs> okay, there's an issue. You should not be counting down until payday. You should be free. You should be living with freedom, without anxiety, without fear. If, you, if, if, if finance is crippling you, you need to surrender. Okay, you need to surrender and maybe if you need to speak to someone, you need to speak to someone and say, hey, I'm really struggling with my finances. I don't get out every month and I don't know how to get through this. Then you speak to someone who you trust and they help you through it. And there are a lot of people that you can speak to. Um, but we really need to allow God to invade. Not invade, it's his. <laughs> He's not invading. <laughs> it belonged to him in the first place. Um, we need to allow him to take what is his. It does not belong to us. So are we allowing God to be Lord, King, over everything? Or only the areas that's comfortable and that we want Him to have? You see, you're, you're only going to learn that God is the provider when you surrender. You're only going to see how good a provider He is when you allow him to take that space. But when you're filling that gap the whole time and you're not allowing him to be the provider, you guys get what I'm trying to say? So God is asking you, if God is asking me to give away two times my salary, okay, and I'm like, no, God, I don't have faith for that. Well, I'm probably going to get through that month and I'm going to still be here. But if I chose in that moment to say, yes, Lord, I'll be obedient, it doesn't make sense. Um, we're not going to have money for groceries this month. Um, but I see you're asking me to do this. It's been confirmed, and I'm doing it out of faith. And I say, Lord, I'm giving away two times my salary this month. And we actually have groceries, and we actually have food, and everything's okay. Man, I learned so much about God that month, seeing that your God is the provider, and I do not need to worry. But if I chose against, and, and I was disobedient, I never gave God the opportunity to show me that part of him. So for you to learn and see God as the provider, you actually need to allow him to. And you need to have the faith to give when he stirs that thing in your heart. You see, Matthew 6, earlier in Matthew 6, verse 19 to 21, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where neither thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So not my words. There it stands. Okay, then all the rest. So we spoke about home. We spoke about finances. And now we're talking about all the rest. And I just put them all together. That's church, ministry, work, sport. Whatever you're doing, mostly, during every day. We read 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. It says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So it's not about what you're doing. It's about why you're doing it. So, again, me playing squash or me attending small group. Attending small group is not more spiritual than me playing squash. But the motivation behind both is what's really important. Why am I playing squash? Why am I attending small group? Usually my heart behind attending small group is for God's kingdom to come, and therefore it's good. And often me behind it playing squash could just be an escape instead of coming to God. And that's why it's probably bad. But if my heart behind playing squash is to take care of my body, to be fit, to be healthy, and to be in a community where I can actually speak the gospel, not just being my Christian bubble, but being involved in a community where I can spread the gospel and have an opportunity to build relationships with people that don't know God, well, then that's really allowing God's kingdom to come. Because my heart behind being in that community it's not to promote myself, but it's for his kingdom to come. So it's not about what you're doing and what 
you're doing to make your time pass. It's about why are you doing it? Why are you doing the things you're doing every day, every week? So why are you serving in church? What's your reason behind it? Are you clearing your conscience because everyone every week stands in the front saying you need to serve? Or are you doing it unto the Lord? Why are you facilitating a small group? Um, why are you doing it? What's the reason behind it? Why are you working at whatever, wherever you're working? What's the reason why you are still there? Why don't you quit? Why do you play the sport? And why do you exercise at this place? What, what is your motivation behind the things you're doing? Is it for selfish gain? Or is it for his kingdom to come? Is it for his will to be done through your life? Has it become a habit? Or is it still for a godly purpose? Because sometimes things start out of a good place. And we start doing things with a really good intention and with a really, really good heart. But a year, two years, maybe even a couple of months down the line, we actually forgot about what the purpose of that was. And I can just share from my life. So I've been playing squash since a very young age. Um, and I've been representing Namibia from a very young age as well. And God in 2014 he actually start, asked me to stop. No, not 2014. That was second year university. Second year Wolfish Bay was 2018, 2018. In 2018, God asked me to stop playing squash indefinitely. Um, so he pressed on my heart that I need to stop. Um, I not stop for a year. He said, Donnie, stop. And I stopped playing squash. And I said, okay, if it's the Lord's will for me to never play squash again, so be it. Um, and I made that decision um, to stop. Obviously, all of a sudden, everyone else around me starts playing squash. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, here. <laughs> um, and it was tough, but man, God did so much more in my heart. Um, and he had to do something in my heart that I couldn't do while I was playing. And he had to free me from that idol. Um, and it became an idol. Something that be began as a very good thing it became an idol in my life, and it became part of my identity. Um, and God needs to free us from something. And something before God to free you, he needs to remove you. Because you've come so close to that thing that he needs to take you away. Um, yeah. So I just want to encourage you with that. If, if something is so close, and later God said it's okay to play again, but it's never been the same. Um, since I asked to stop, like the way I play, the reason I play, the motivation behind it is totally different to what it was before I made that act of surrender. So I want you, your homework for this week is to write down your why statement. So I want you to write down, well, why are you, let's get to the others now, now but firstly, just, just remind yourself of what your purpose is in a, at home. Why are you the husband of? Why are you the father of? Why are you part of this family? What is your role within this family? Why are you working at? Why are you doing this sport? Just, and be really honest, okay? If you are saying, I play squash because I need to get away from home for an hour every week, well, say that, okay? Don't be fake. God knows your heart. You need to be really honest. And then you need to say, God, this is, this is what it is currently. Okay, then maybe you can draw a line and say, this is what I know the answer is supposed to be. <laughs> and then you ask God to help you. But it doesn't help you write down, like we always say, God can't change who you pretend to be. So you need to be real before the Lord. Write down real, honest, wise statements. It's between you and God. You don't need to share it with anyone. And you say, God, I know this is what it's supposed to look like. Please help me. Show me what it's supposed to look like. Because it's, it's different for different people. So, yeah, while writing them, is to really prayerfully consider whether some of those things need to be removed. Some things have become godly habits, and if 
me playing squash is taking so much of my time and taking so much of my energy and my headspace, it's not allowing me to fulfill my why statement at home. Well, then my why at squash needs to be, I need to stop. <laughs> because then you need to write it in the right priority. What is the most important? Okay, what is, and serving in church comes second to loving your wife. Okay? Our homes come first. Okay, and your home, your husband, your wife, your family needs to be first. Okay, and from that place we serve. From that place we love other people. From that place we go and lead businesses. We need, our leader, we need to lead our home first. Then we lead the business. Lead our home first. Then we lead the church. Then we lead the ministry. Then we do all those other things. So make sure you do it in the right priority so that if you see this thing is causing me to not be able to do that one, that one at the bottom needs to go to the rubbish bin. So I'm trusting that when you write down those why statements, is that God will reveal to you where you've become selfish. And that He will reveal to you how easy it is to shift it and to allow His kingdom to come in that place. Because it's really simple, as I said now, now it's a moment of surrender. It's really just you saying, God, I'm sorry, I repent meaning I turn away from these old ways, I turn towards a new way, and you're like, Lord, help me. And if you need to write down that why statement on your laptop, on your background, wherever you are, wherever you're working, if it's on a spanner you use very often, write, put it there, <laughs> whatever job you're doing, put it somewhere where you can see it, where you can remind yourself of it to remember, why am I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? What is my purpose? Because if you are grounded in your why, these other little frustrations that is bothering you will not bother you so much because you know why you're there in the first place. Because we need to let God's kingdom come everywhere. Okay, in our homes, in our workplaces, in the grocery market, at church on Sundays, at small groups. But everywhere, we are not just spiritual when we come to church and when we retain small group. God's kingdom needs to come everywhere. It's the only way the gospel is going to reach the world and reach this town. Is if His kingdom comes in your life and in my life, everywhere. But then we need to know why we're doing what we're doing. Because if all the Christians... I mean, if we just take everyone in this building this morning, we are at very different places during the week. And if each of us allows God's kingdom to come where we have been placed, man, this town is going to change. And His kingdom is going to come and the lost are going to be saved. And the broken hearted are going to be healed. And again, we need, to, we need to be really real this morning. This all sounds very nice, very spiritual. But for God's kingdom to come, as you see in that scripture, you need to seek it. Okay, we need to seek His kingdom first. How much do you want His kingdom to come? Is your heart really, do you really want people to be saved? Do you really want people with hurt to be healed? I mean, do you, do you really want it or do you, do you really want it but God used them? God used that person because I don't have time. And God used them because I've got too much of my own issues. God, I've got so much stuff I still need to sort out. I cannot possibly help someone else. 
you'll be, you'll be amazed how God sorts out your issues or how you allow him to be used to help other people. You do not need the qualification, and we say it so much. You do not need to be perfect. Okay, God wants to use you with your issues. He wants to use me with my issues. I mean, look at where I'm standing. <laughs> you don't even know half of my issues. And I'm standing here this morning, and that's just grace. Um, God wants to use each of us without being perfect, without having everything figured out. So the question is really, how much do you want it? And again, first at home. It doesn't help you want to change the town, but you don't want to change your house. Because at home is sometimes where it hurts the most. You see, if we realize the impact of Jesus Christ and the cross and what he did, we need to realize that he died for us, but he died for everyone. Okay, and there are people that don't know that. So the question is really also this morning, where are you? Has his kingdom come in you? Because his kingdom first needs to come in you before it can come through you. So God first needs to change your life. And by that I'm not saying you need to be perfect, otherwise it sounds like I'm contradicting myself. It first comes to him, just you surrendering to him as king. So have you surrendered to Jesus Christ, God, as Lord and Savior of your life? If you have not, then the sermon wasn't for you. <laughs> then you need to go and listen to last week's sermon. I need to make God Lord and Savior of your life. Once he's been made Lord and Savior, where it means his kingdom has come in you, and you've said no to my kingdom, yes to his kingdom. Now you say, Lord, now I allow what you've done in me to come through to other people as well. Because it's not a selfish kingdom. I mean, the apostles were sent out and they went. This kingdom was never meant to be held between four walls and for yourself. And, and as I said, if God hasn't become Lord and King of your life, this sermon and this morning is going to sound really tough. It's going to sound like a lot of dead works. Again, you're going to try and do these things, and you're going to come back next week, and you're going to be like, Yo, I tried, but I really couldn't. And then I want to encourage you to go back. Make sure he's king. Make sure he's king. Make sure you've laid down your life. Make sure you've denied yourself. Okay, and from that place, we allow his kingdom to come. Otherwise, this is just dead works. Um, when you make him king, you realize he loves you as you are. Okay, and we don't do this to deserve his love. We don't do this so that he accepts us. You're already accepted. You're already loved. But because he loves you so much, you cannot help but do this. It's a, just a response to his love. So realize his love. Realize his holiness. Realize his goodness. And when we realize that, these things will just flow and they'll just happen by itself. So, yeah, we can just close our eyes. Um, Lord, I, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are here. I thank you that you are with us. Um, and Lord, I pray that right now in this moment, anyone struggling to see how loved and how accepted they are and they're feeling really condemned after listening to the sermon, I pray that right now your spirit will just minister to them. And I thank you that they are not condemned. I thank you that they are so, so loved. I thank you that no lie of the enemy will have any power, but your plan and your purpose for this morning will prevail. I thank you that condemnation can just leave in Jesus' name. I thank you that conviction will remain. I thank you that we are so loved by you, and because we are so loved by you, we cannot but respond. We cannot but follow you and live for you and make your kingdom come. I pray, Father God, Holy Spirit, that you will ignite the hunger in us for your kingdom to come first before anything else. That we will not live for our own kingdoms and our own wills and our own desires. But we will say we have laid down our life 
and our purpose on this earth while we have breath is to make your kingdom come that your name be known in this town by every person Lord that every household may be saved may we have desires and ambition for the lost to be saved in this town for broken hearts to be healed for the lost to be set free Father God may that be our heart's desire every day and every moment and where the things of this world and the pleasures of this world are looking so nice for us Lord I pray that we will just turn away I thank you for faith that we will have the faith to follow you and believe you even when we don't see So let's just give about a couple of minutes. If you've got a pen and paper, you're welcome to write down your why statements. If you just want to just meditate and speak to God on the word this morning, you're welcome to do that as well. I'll close off for us shortly.